Okay, welcome back everyone. Um, so we will proceed for our second talk. Okay, our second speaker is Professor Abhi Verakumarasivam with the title of Times to Man Up, Gender Equity and Equality and Higher Education in Leaderships. Uh, but before we proceed, I would like to read the biography of Prof. Abhi. Uh, Prof. Abhi is a Dean of School of Medical and Life Sciences at Sunway University. He is actually the Cambridge trained geneticist, educator and also science communicator. His research is um, genetics involved, the elucidation of component of the regulatory pathway that drive tumor yeah, recurrence and invasion as well as dissecting Asian genetic variations that confer difference in disease risk and response to therapy. In recognition of his achievement, he has been awarded multiple awards, including the National Cancer Council Malaysia Cancer Research Award, the Merdeka Award Grant, and Jean T. Lees. In 2016, he became the first Asian to be crowned as the best science communicator at the International Film Lab Final at the Chatelholm Science Festival, United Kingdom. He is currently the co-chair of the Asian Young Scientist Network, which represents top young scientists in the region, who not only demonstrated academic excellence, but also contribute towards nation building through STEM promotion and advocacy. He also currently chair the International Network for Government Science Ad, uh, advice Asia, which aim to support the use of scientific evidence in informing policy at all level of government, including pandemic crisis responses. He also sit on various national and regional science and educational policy community and has co-authored various policy papers and reports. He also co-initiate and lead Malaysia's first nationwide program on responsible conduct of research to create awareness and also educate the Malaysian scientific community on the importance of research integrity. Prof. Abi truly believe that the greatest healthcare challenge facing us in the 21st century can only be addressed through an inter interdisciplinary approach that promote effective communication and policies that support the translation of scientific discovery and enable technology to improve the quality of life and promote social justice. Uh, therefore, I welcome Prof. Abi today with a very interesting topic. So the virtual floor is yours, Prof. Abi. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Wan Fatma. Let me try and get my slides to share. Um, can everyone see my slides? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. So, first of all, I'd like to apologize for the very long introduction. Uh, please, the next time around, I, I need to be reminded that I should write something a lot shorter. Uh, but as you can see, as a man, I obviously don't have the same imposter syndrome uh, to actually brag about all my achievements, which really are not individual achievements, but a collective one. And so, thank you very much to ACAP and the organizers uh, for giving me this opportunity. Um, and when I was actually asked to give this uh, talk, um, you know, the title that was actually offered was about leaky pipelines. And I was like, no, I'm not going to do that. I think um, it's really, really important uh, that I, I explain why I've chosen this particular uh, topic today. And I'll start off by ensuring that we actually have um, a disclosure slide. First of all, I categorically want to say this, that I'm not an authority on gender studies, and I will not pretend to fully understand what it means to be a woman and one in higher education. My qualified success is certainly, uh, first of all, qualified. Uh, there's still a lot of things that I think I need to achieve before um, you know, I can uh, be considered as actually achieving my true potential. Uh, and uh, really, a lot of what I've done so far has been truly a result of amazing men and women who have nurtured, educated, trusted, and provided me with the opportunities to discover myself and my purpose. 
And my sharing is a really personal one, and I want to make sure that I'm not pretending uh, that my experience is something that's going to resonate with everyone uh, all the time. But it also reflects the heterogeneity that exists, both in the context of the experiences, the perspectives, our own attitudes, behavior, and also understanding that these attitudes and behaviors that we have on this topic and many other topics aren't universal, are not constant. They are really context, topological, temporarily, really very situationally dependent. And so it's really meant to be a self-reflection and a critique of our personal and collective social and professional responsibilities. And this is exactly uh, the kind of, um, uh, uh, I guess, spirit in which I agreed uh, to do this particular topic. I just realized my slide order is slightly messed up, so I'm going to go back to the second slide here and then jump to another slide. The reality is that it's still a man's world. And we heard today from the ACAP director a couple of statistics, and, and we also heard that even in countries where we think uh, there's definitely a more outwardly expressed support for equity and equality at many different levels, uh, even a country like Canada um, has got its own legacies as well as current inequity and equity issues. And so these are some statistics that uh, collected from the main media as well as uh, uh, the literature out there. And you can see that women in Malaysia are underrepresented in all levels of decision making uh, positions. Yes, progress is constantly being made, but we have to admit that we still have not reached the desired state. 6.5% of company board chairs are women and only 24% of board seats are held by women. 3.7% of company CEOs are women. 33 or 14.9% of elected representatives in the parliament are women. Of course, that's always changing, uh, but never significantly in terms of the number of women. And only 12.9% of the cabinet ministers, both ministers and deputy ministers in the current administration are women. Um, and of course, with the recent elections, you know, uh, we, it was, I know when I read the headlines, uh, the Johor Menteri Besar, Dr. On Hafiz Ghazi, talked about the new lineup is also, you know, it includes those from various races and took into account, took into account of the gender balance, which reflects the true face of Johor. And so I was really excited. I wanted to see that exco and how that exco looked. And this is it. This is what our leaders think gender balance is. And I'm not denigrating our Johor um, uh, Menteri Basar because I think this is perhaps quite representative towards all the excos that are actually out there, all the different, and it's also corporate Malaysia and higher education Malaysia. If we think that this is gender balance, and remember this, that we elect our representatives, and that's the pool in which they can actually choose from too. Perhaps we should be introspectively asking ourselves. In the context of higher education, I think we heard um, the director of ACAP, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll actually present a snippet of that data earlier, that there are now more female lecturers than male lecturers. And I think this is reflected from the fact that um, uh, public higher education institutions, especially, uh, have had a larger female enrollment um, you know, up to 61.1%. In fact, the, when the newspapers uh, got hold of this news, they called the, the lost boys, examining the lost boys. Um, in the private institutions, you also see that, but it's not exactly the same. And I think it's really, really an interesting disparity there of almost 10%. And, and what is it that, you know, the public and private higher educations are doing or the kind of access that's actually resulting in such varied differentiation. Um, and so this was uh, the, the data that was presented by the director earlier. And now there is a higher uh, percentage of academic staff um, in higher education. And so if that's the case, then has gender equality really achieved? I think we need to deep dive a little bit into the data that's there. 
And maybe the data has changed uh, in, in 2022 because this data is essentially of 2020. Female lecturers outnumber male lecturers by 58.8% to 41.25. But when you go down to associate professors, it drops to 45.6. And then when it goes to female professors, it drops further to 31%. So we're not too dissimilar to uh, what the statistics that we heard from Canada earlier. Some may argue that this is just, uh, you know, perhaps a time factor because it's only in recent times we have had more uh, women lecturers. Will this now change uh, in, say, 10 or 15 years' time? I hope so. Uh, but I think we need to be conscious that certainly this agenda needs to be pushed so that we also ensure that it reflects the reality on the ground. And it's also equally interesting that in the public higher education, it's 31%, but in the private higher education, only 19.6% of professors are females. So that's also an interesting, you know, uh, I guess, research question that we need to deep dive to understand why this is the case. But most importantly is that we cannot deny that it is the case, that there is a gender equality gap in our senior academic roles. And if you go even higher, in 2020, only two of the vice chancellors in public universities were women. Four were appointed as deputy vice chancellor, one as the chair of the board of governors, and 42 of the board members were women. And you can see that the numbers are all between 5 and 20%, perhaps reflecting our Johor X goal. A quick check as of today, among the top five research universities in Malaysia, none of the appointed vice chancellors are women. And of the 19 appointed deputy vice chancellors, only 26.3% are women. And I'm sure many of you are thinking, but there are so many amazing women, right? Our reason uh, minted Toko uh, uh, academic uh, Nagara. Dato Asma, right, uh, will, you know, arguably, you know, such an, you know, amazing individual, uh, my, my really dear mentor, uh, you know, I also tease her that she's my professional mother who scares the hell out of me, but also has provided me with amazing opportunities and has inspired, inspired me to do so many things. And she's a lady of so many firsts, right, uh, led so many different universities and has proven, you know, that you can be strong, and yet you can also be nurturing and caring. But Dr. Dr. Asma Ismail is not the only one that I've had the privilege of being mentored and being provided these opportunities. Many of you, you know, know that I got trained in Cambridge, but my first degree was from UPM. And I also worked at UPM for 10 years before coming to Sunwave. And I must thank this woman here, Professor Datin Paduka Dato, Dr. Aini Idris too, who has provided so many different opportunities to me personally, but many will argue her leadership at UPM from the time when she was a dean to the graduate studies to being a deputy vice chancellor and then to a vice chancellor has been the best thing that ever happened to UPM. And for me, that amazing opportunities that she created, that natural instinct of caring, making sure that she balances institutional interests with a personal interest, will always be something that I'm inspired by in the way I then deal with my younger colleagues and peers. And then we have Professor Datin Paduka Katija Yusuf. So we are constantly arguing and fighting uh, but, you know, she is my dearest research collaborator whose research achievements I can only one day hope to achieve even 50 or 70 percent of what she has done in her lifetime. And for me, just having the opportunity to learn from somebody who perhaps is about four, uh, four times less in terms of volume, but certainly four times more in terms of impact and all the good things, um, is a really humbling opportunity to realize that great things can come in all kinds of different packages. And 
These days, for the last five years, I've had the opportunity to work with another amazing leader, Professor Dr. Elizabeth Lee, who embodies all the different characteristics that I've actually mentioned, but most importantly, another word, which is called sponsorship, that she's able to put her own reputational risk to provide me with those opportunities to drive my agenda. So I've shown, I've shown four amazing women, but you might argue that these women uh, perhaps had the time to develop themselves. Many younger women are just not ready. And this is where I will also say that's not true. I was really lucky to be a founding member of the Young Scientist Network, um, and then having the opportunity to become the president for a while. And when it was time for me to step down in 2016, um, we've decided, and it was really the, the, the foresight of the exec that decided that the best to take over from my leadership would be Dr. Chai Lei Cheng. And Dr. Chai, together with many female individuals that you see on this website and many who also served in the EXCO with me, continue to inspire me because these individuals are certainly way more talented. Perhaps they are not as shameless as me. Maybe that's the only thing that perhaps sets me apart. But they are certainly way more talented, way more you know, uh, gracious. And, and most importantly, they provide the diverse perspectives. And they provide the one value that we kind of don't appreciate. That leadership is not about age, but leadership is about the intrinsic character of that individual and really the ability of that individual to express their value in different situations. And so I don't think, and I know for a fact that we certainly don't have an inequality in terms of potential. The question is, do we have or can we create an ecosystem that can actually create and translate that potential into the reality that I'm sure everybody in this web, web webinar is actually aspiring for. And so the big question is, oh my God, why do I have to listen to a man to tell me what women need? And I'll try to attempt to answer it. First of all, we really need to address the differences between inequalities and inequities, because a lot of time it's used interchangeably. And, and really, I think that's part of the problem. When we talk about inequality, it is the unequal access to opportunities. So let's look at this as two individuals. One's a boy with a red um, uh, uh, jumper, and then you have a girl in a blue jumper. And if you are equally, you know, good parent, you'll say, I'm going to be equal. I'm going to give 50% of the land to the, my son and 50% of the land to my daughter. And, you know, they, wherever the apples drop, that apple is that particular child. And just looking at this tree, you will know that the num while the, number, the amount of space that individual has is the same, the number of apples will not be the same. And so then you say, okay, let's talk about equity then, right? How can we, um, you know, and before that, maybe say, okay, but let's make sure we evenly distribute the tools and assistance. Must give them equally because I love them equally. You might give them the tools and now one might say, okay, I don't have to rely on the luck for the apple to drop. Now I've got the tool to go and pick those apples myself, my own effort. But hey, your daughter in blue does not have the same opportunity. She might have the same tools and assistance, but certainly not the same opportunity. And this is, I guess, to a certain extent, why all of us sometimes feel like an imposter, because we are constantly placed in different circumstances. Our KPIs at the end of the year ensures that we all have to tick, tick the check boxes. It doesn't look at what is it that we are great and amazing and celebrate that because that compensates for some things that we perhaps will never be able to do. 
much like a fish. If you ask the fish to climb the tree, the fish will never be able to do that. And that's where, you know, meritocracy, and I think in Malaysia, it's always been a touchy issue. And that's because of some of our affirmative action policies, which I actually support. Because this cartoon really illustrates why this notion of meritocracy, if we only look at it through a lens of equality, is a problem. For example, Jim on the left, if you measure Jim and Seng on the right, purely on the final output, which is the marks, you'll say Jim is the amazing kid compared to Seng. But look at the IQs, they're actually equal. But their performance in the exams aren't. And why is that? Because one kid has all the support, whereas another kid has to do housework and certainly lacks those support. And we measure people only through one lens, you'll find that our definition of success is different. And that's where equity comes along, because it says that actually the, the level, the playing field is not level. And there needs to be an address that you have to address the importance of actually making sure that somebody actually has that equal chance. And that means you have to customize the tools, you have to identify the problem and address that. And so in this case, of course, for the girl, she needs a, lot, a, a higher ladder, right? And therefore then she might be able to get apples. But if you actually look very closely, there's still more apples on the left because there is a problem at the root. And so really it's time for us to think about equality as the same with equity only when there really is equal opportunities for everyone. We need to ask ourselves when we say, yeah, everyone has got a chance. Does everyone have a chance to actually achieve that output? For example, in this case, if the output was the ability to stand on the stand, then yes, everyone achieves on the left. But if what you desire is to watch football, then in this picture, on the left, only two could see. But if you distribute your resources, you'll find that it is possible for all three to see. And that's equity. And there are many ways to look at equity and many ways in which the principle of justice comes there to actually address equity. And it's all about fixing the systemic root of the problem. True, at some point, you want to make sure that you live in an equal society. And that can only happen if, in this case, you fix the root of the problem. And once you do that, then perhaps everyone can equally compete without the need for differentiation. I've had the opportunity over the last five years to work on various different projects to be able to try and understand the state of young scientists in Malaysia and the region. And I'm just going to share with you some of the results from this study. And I know that it's five years ago, and perhaps it's time, perhaps, you know, I was talking to um, Associate Professor Dr. Yasrina just now, it's perhaps an opportune time for, you know, ACAP and uh, IPPN in USM and various different organizations, including YSN and ASM, to think about, you know, perhaps it's time to also start getting more knowledge and evidence-informed uh, data to work on addressing some of these issues that this webinar has raised. I think it's important, I started about the word called heterogeneity. Because heterogeneity is not just about our life experiences at home, our opportunities, but also the fact that higher education and the roles that you and I play are so different and are so diverse um, that when you know, I have open days, when students come and ask me, what do I do every day? Um, it's amazing that actually every day is so different because you've got all kinds of responsibilities. And it's because of those responsibilities and really great that our previous speaker talked about how it's amazing, you know, she's a dean now, but there are certain skill sets that she was not equipped, um, you know, when she actually assumed that position. And when we talk about obstacles that ASEAN scientists feel 
And when you talk about scientists, it also includes social science and arts and humanities. So it's, it's you could argue a researcher rather than the word scientist. We've got to be more inclusive in our choice of words too. You will see that although power harassment, gender harassment, sexual orientation were not the most common, you will notice that close to 50% still thought it was extremely influential and very influential in their lives. And it's easy for us to just look at academic freedom, not enough money, not enough research grants as the main cause that's impeding. But remember what we talked about, when you actually have those resources, if you don't fix the root problems, those inequalities will still exist. And when we talked about the mentoring that ASEAN scientists needed, you will also see that while things like presentation of results and scientific writing, because we are also focused on our KPIs, the reality is, you know, family care and relative, the related support was still a significant problem, right? At more than almost 60% uh, felt that they were. And we should have also analyzed it from a gender perspective too, to see whether there was a difference between males and female scientists when they actually responded to the same questions. And this is where the need to man up comes for. Why are these problems still there? Despite when I started earlier, I shared about these amazing women that have led and continue to lead and provided with many thousands of people, including myself, the opportunity. And the first phenomenon that I want to share today, which I think you all know about, it's called the Boys Club. And the Boys Club, as you know, seen here uh, in this picture, and especially in the higher education and research ecosystem, has in the past been dominated by men, white men, and, and to a certain extent, as many other Asian countries started developing their ecosystem, because they were trained in similar ecosystems, they brought that same kind of culture. What is that culture? It's a culture that perhaps is an unconscious bias, but it's a bias that will influence how the leadership is chosen. And because that leadership are mostly men, women are often overlooked for promotions, career advancement, because of that perceived, yeah, just she kind of lacks something. I don't know what to call, but something, right? And that's, you know, when you can't actually say something bad about a person, but you still want to reject that person, it clearly is because that it's that bias that's actually talking. But the old boys club is not just about bias. It's because that there's close friendship. There's that conflict of interest where that personal friendship comes into play. Financial interest also comes into play. This culture also is associated with the promotion of cover-ups, silencing, and just ignoring and turning a blind eye to the injustice that actually out there. And there are multiple examples of that actually happening uh, in the police, uh, in the UK, uh, you know, in, in corporate America, and in Malaysia too. The Women Aid uh, uh, Organization, I think, interviewed about a thousand people sometime in September last year, and they found that 50% of Malaysian women experience this gender discrimination in the workplace. And this culture of si silence amongst men when they encounter sexual harassment and sexist behavior at work um, also kind of as accentuated. You would think that perhaps it's reducing because of movements such as Me Too, Black Lives Matter, and cancel culture. You would think that these movements are creating greater awareness. But the reality is that a survey that was done last year identified that actually there was a pushback that 60% of male managers, and this work was done in the US and in Europe. Uh, we don't have an equivalent Asian survey. But 60% of male managers now say that they are uncomfortable participating in work activities with women. That they are unlikely, like 12 times more unlikely than, you know, uh, to, to organize a, a, a scheduled one-to-one -one meeting with a junior woman as opposed to one with a junior man. 12 times more. What does that tell you? The kind of opportunities to get to know your colleague? The opportunities to get mentorship. I can only imagine if Dato Asma, Datin Khatija, and Prof Aini 
and from Elizabeth, were 12 times unlikely to meet me in person, to hear me, I would have not had any of the opportunities that I have today. And the culture of silence also blunts the willingness of people to come up because I are, never mind, la, it's maybe the way you dress, maybe the way you talk, um, you know, maybe it's the way uh, you look. It's that culture. And recently, Vietnam introduced new labor laws that require employers to place mechanisms to prevent uh, sexual harassment in the workplace. But they found that the culture to not to report, the culture to blame the victim, and you can already see that parallels in this country too, prevents them from even coming out to speak out or for people to speak about. And all of these accentuates that stereotypes. And we've seen many, many examples, including now currently, um, when the, the first black woman American uh, Supreme Court justice was appointed, um, the uh, kind of questions that she was actually subjected to. Um, same thing, look at you know, Bill Clinton's uh, uh, Hillary Clinton, no wonder Bill is afraid because, you know, she's angry with regards to the Benghazi. Then you have two UK politicians, you know, Nicola Sturgeon, the First Minister of Scotland, and Theresa May, the previous Prime Minister of UK. Look at the title, never mind Brexit, who won legs it? Who has got better legs? Do you see that with our, our male politicians? And it's the same thing, right? We also hear about the clothes or the fashion statements that our female politicians and ministers uh, make when they wear whatever, but we don't hear that about our male politicians, who I think are equally flamboyant, right? When you think about how colorful their batiks and suits are. So it's really important to realize that all those biases that actually were there has also engendered our stereotype. And yesterday I had a mini uh, accident and I had to go to the police station. And this is real story. I, was, I, I had to go to the traffic police to report. I mean, and it was just a very minor thing. And I must say, they were very professional and they, they, were, they followed the rules and they were all perfectly fine. But as I was sitting and waiting, you know, this was a girl that was a bit exasperated and she was trying to explain. And this police officer was very friendly and was very polite and nice. But he made this statement. Yeah, yeah, dalam sejarah saya bekerja di sini, tak pernah sekalipun perempuan salah. Kalau perempuan langgar tiang, tianglah yang salah. And everyone in the police station laughed. To be fair to the, the policeman, he did, in the end, you know, get everything that was needed from the woman and she was smiling and leaving. But for me, that perhaps, you know, aggravated me a little bit because I felt that, no, it's not right to say that. Because what that also means is that the woman's word should be taken differently than a man's word. If a man and a woman are sitting in front of the police officer, that bias that that woman will always never admit her fault as opposed to a man who may admit his fault, who do you think they're actually going to believe? And this morning, therefore, I decided, let me just put woman driver and see what cartoons can come out immediately from Google. And these were the first four that actually came out. And the last one for me, it is so scary, right? Because you associate that with witches, right? And, and for me, basically, this again perpetuates this intergenerational and centuries of persecution of women. And another important area that we have to recognize, and this is partly, if not wholesomely, male's fault too. Of course, we did not design the reproductive um, you know, roles that men and women play differently, but it's still our choice to actually result in the disproportionate responsibility of childcare and housework. And I'm the first one to also equally admit that I don't do as much. And COVID-19 has accentuated this. The reality is the COVID-19 pandemic has reversed the important gains 
that have been made over the last decade for women in the workforce. An Australian study was also done that motherhood and looking after the children and all the various different elements will actually cost a typical average Australian woman $876,000 Aussie dollars throughout her lifetime. And over 2 million mothers left the labor force in 2020, according to new global estimates. Think about that millions of amazing talent. And these are two books that I really think all men have to read. And I would also encourage women to read it only so that they understand that if any time you feel that perhaps you are not as good, you've got to actually read this so that you understand that there is something like white privilege, there is male privilege, there is entitlement. And it's something that we have to recognize that I'm here today partly because of some of the biases and stereotype that has actually enabled me to be in this position today. And finally, there's something called toxic masculinity. And you saw that with Chris Rock and Will Smith recently at the Oscars. The tendency to show that I am more man if I actually show intimidation and violence. I am more man if I'm actually very hard and I don't show any sign of weakness. And I'm more man if I don't show that I'm sad or in distress. And it's really, really important to understand that, you know, that may have been at some point a wrongly perceived, but a prevalent thought. But today, there's absolutely no space in that. Because it's that same toxic masculinity that affects women, the opportunities. It's also resulting in why males have a poorer health outcome. And that's why those of you who know me well, in, in, the, in the month of November, you will actually see me wearing a mustache. And you know, I, I look horrible with a mustache. And, and, but that mustache is to actually encourage more men to actually take charge of their health, called Movember. Because again, it's part of their own toxic masculinity. And that's why I, was, I thought that this year, it was really good, like Wakanda, the, term of, uh, the theme of International Women's Day was about breaking that bias. Because for me, that is the single biggest thing. And it's not just women that needs to break that bias. All of us have to be, break that bias because after all, it's men who has perpetuated that bias. I've got a couple of quotes that I want to share. And, and this is Ed, Eldridge Cleaver. And many of you may not know him, but he is a, a black activist and was very much involved in the formation of you know, a lot of the agenda to fight against it. And he was perhaps some perceived as someone who's really radicalist. You are either part of the solution or you're part of the problem. That's only for him, very black and white. You're either part of the solution or you're part of the problem. If you choose not to be part of the solution, you are part of the problem. But I like Desmond Tutu's. If you are in a neutral in situations of injustice, you have chosen the side of the oppressor. So to all the men listening in here, or perhaps the women who are a little bit more pacifist, which is like, never mind, let them have their time. You know, we will be judged in another day. You must realize that this is not a time to sit on the fence. You actually have to make a sense because as we talked about the difference between equality and inequity, it's about the rights to justice. And I'm not suggesting we all pick up arms and now start fighting for it. I love this quote from Maya Angelou. And it's, it's really interesting, right? I mean, when you listen, you know, it's, it's from a woman as well. If you don't like something, change it. If you can't change it, you change your attitude. So if you don't feel like you are not empowered enough, change your attitude first. But I think the prevalent thing here is with regards to gender inclusivity, we have to admit that we are part of the problem. All of us are part of the problem. And we have to play our part in the various solutions <clears throat> because there are no one solution, but multiple solutions to work on. And because men are part of, at the moment, the majority of leadership positions, the only way that men can actually help is by doing it. We need to play the role of encouraging young girls to have that ambition. We have to actively reach out 
to mentor and provide those opportunities like what we received. And we also have to acknowledge these privileges. And rather than say, oh, I will be the savior of all women, you should be about being an ally to be able to support that movement of gender equity and equality. So don't try to be a savior. Try to be an ally. Try to be a friend. And why we should do it? Because all of us also have kids or maybe younger sisters or friends who also one day will be suffering what all the women out there suffer on a daily life. And for me, I always think about my daughter. And I just think I really need to make sure that the world is a better place than what perhaps my wife and my mother had. And that's my daughter, of course, breaking all the rules in my lab. But, you know, she's a total, you know, she loves all the princessy stuff, but she also likes dissecting cockroaches, loves doing all kinds of menial stuff, you know, and encourage her, do whatever you want. But also equally, I know at this juncture, I can control things. But in the future, <clears throat> it's also going to be other people who will influence her. Another important factor, I think, <clears throat> I also know that I need to keep quiet a lot more. And I'm lucky I have people like Dr. Chai who will say, uh, Abi, just shut up now. I think we have better ideas. Just listen to us first. It's really important to be more open to everyone's opinions. You've got to listen to women, not say, I understand, I understand, and also reflect it on our own experiences. We've got to challenge the assumptions we actually have. And we also got to be a bit more sensitive and attentive to these biases and don't pretend that we know. And it's all about empathy. And that's really part of communication too. You've got to see with the eyes of another, listen with the ears of another, and feel with the hearts of another. Because too long, the world that we are in, too long for a lot of our education paradigms have all been viewed through a lens of people that generally wear this type of shoes. And perhaps it's time to actually start. I'm not suggesting that all men to go out in red stilettos. If you wanted to be a little bit more comfortable, you could be wearing this. But my point here is to really metaphorically start understanding the narratives of different individuals. What's wrong with this picture? Anyone wants to share? The first thing that comes to you, to your mind? Mostly men. Yeah, great. And I think in this case, it is all men. I was quite tempted to actually put up some of the webinars um, that have actually been going on these last few months in Malaysia, but I thought, okay, it's really no time to shame people. But the reality is that this, I think, was a UN event. And absolutely, you're rightly pointing out, it is wrong that it's only men. So it's really important for everyone to recognize that, and I think both men and women, but it sounds way easier for a man to say, I am sorry, I am not sitting on this panel because there is not an equal representation of women and men. We have to actively inform because not everyone is aware yet. So we are still at a state where we need to advocate. Until we reach 50% on all those indices, nobody should be able to convince you that we are there yet. We might have 30% club, 40% society. What is equality? It's when everyone has an equal opportunity. So it's really important that we actively engage, mentor, create greater awareness. And I think one of the easiest things that we can do is just say no. And I know ACAP and IPTN knows that when they asked me to speak, I was like, why are you asking me? You should have. And then they told me, no, they want to hear more diversity. I said, yes, but this is all about women that I will not agree to do this unless I know who is speaking. And I will even cancel last minute if we don't actually have as many or more women on today's event. Because more and more, I think everyone would agree that from committees to seminars to whatever it is, diversity, not just gender. Um, I just finished a, a study together with Dr. Chai uh, with the U.S. National Academy of Sciences on how we can address inaccurate and misleading information. And it was an amazing opportunity 
because all of us came from different backgrounds and you know it was difficult at the start because we were not on the same page but ultimately you know when you see the report you'll find that it's amazing how rich those 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 different perspectives and expertise actually means so everybody here has to advocate that every voice is equal weightage you can't have a token woman as a moderator and say ah at least got one woman what so i think everybody here should sign the pledge before you leave this webinar to say no more manuals and actually make a commitment and a stand including not attending it so really you got to speak out you got to interrupt sexism when you see it you call it um, i tell my staff sometimes if i use wrong language you know please tell me if i've actually made you uncomfortable so that i will make sure that i don't repeat it because i think sometimes today with the cancel culture i think people are becoming more and more scared and you saw that with the statistics that i showed that men are now even resisting from reaching out to actually support so it's really important that we also create that safe space that we make sure that we don't associate education on the importance of equality and equity with shaming people it is not about us that are so supportive of women empowerment versus those who are not because when you start doing that you are going against this whole reason in which you want to promote inclusivity so the same spirit in which you are trying to promote gender equality you also have to make sure that you bring the perspective inequalities together so that they don't look at it as a competition but more an opportunity to come together so it's always about us this is something that i certainly struggle and even the picture when i chose it i realized something is wrong here just because i'm now sitting well it's not me but just because i'm suggesting that men should also you know do the children's homework with the kids it doesn't mean then that that woman has to sit behind and actually cook lunch or whatever it is maybe she can do whatever she wants to do right but i think it's really important uh, the point that i want to make up here is that i'm sure and i saw that especially in the pandemic that the responsibility of housework child care responsibility amazingly my in-laws my mother they they are the most amazingly lovely individuals and they also have certain expectations from me but they have zero expectations for me to do any housework and it's because of that i'm able to focus so much at work and unfortunately my wife doesn't have the same privilege and so it's really important for us you know to actually find ways and this includes perhaps even getting help if you find that we can't do it ourselves but it's really important to ensure that your female partners also have the same kind of freedom that you have the same ability to balance their work and life however they want to actually have and why i say this ultimately is because that inclusive leadership is so 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 critical that leadership at every level but perhaps more so amongst all of you here with some decisional uh, positions resource allocation power the reward and the coercive power that you actually have it's time to see how that you can actually work on these biases and unbiases through our interactions and i wanted to share you know a couple of initiatives for example with acap so since 2018 the young scientists network of academy of sciences malaysia has been working on trying to remodel how we actually look inclusive uh, leadership as the way we think of leadership but trying to rebrand leadership and and really think about how more people can see themselves as leaders and become those leaders and we've been really lucky that you know from uh, 2018 2017 2018 we were able to do it in in Malaysia thanks to acap but of course because of the the pandemic 2020 and 2021 we have um you know done it in uh, online but you'll see that we always try to ensure that there is representation and 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 this year uh, in fact last year we were able to even tr expand this to an apac level and there's so much desire especially among women leaders to actually really ensure that this is actually driven and we have chip fat here
from UPM, who then went back and organized her own event. Dr. Kavita ran a science communication event. Really, it's got to work around you know, all these amazing opportunities. And I think all of this come back, you know, when we talk about leadership, comes to integrity. And when we talk about integrity, sometimes we focus so much on you know, whether people are cheating, uh, whether people are abusive, whether there's falsification, fabrication, and what have you. But the reality is that integrity also means that we must make sure that we don't hijack the purpose of why we do things. And that social responsibility of research, the social responsibility of education, to a certain extent has been hijacked. And I, we won't go into that because that'll be another hour or two hours to actually discuss. But it's time that, you know, as our first speaker talked about this need for to contemplate, we need to reflect and we need to find better ways to be able to do that. And that's what, thanks to ISC and another um, uh, woman leader, Gato Mazlan, or in fact, Gato Sri Mazlan now, you know, who supported this program, that we want to try and push the RCR agenda across. And so my final slides essentially is, organizations must focus on creating great policies, clear frameworks. We must make sure that organizations facilitate open communication, because output and impact need to be clearly defined, not just papers and, and, and impact factors, but that value that you actually truly bring. Also, how work arrangements can also be arranged to facilitate that. Things got to be a lot more transparent and accountable. And finally, way more education, workshop and trainings on the need to create an equitable environment needs to be driven. We have initiatives and targets, like 30% targets uh, at, you know, in corporate governance, also various different tax exemptions. And I'm sure all of you that are filing up taxes at the moment you know, will be aware of all these opportunities. But the question is, are we equitable enough that everybody can truly benefit from these equal opportunities. And so all these national policies that are out there, when I look through those policies, very little of them actually clearly define what higher education uh, you know, needs to do, what implications this policy had at the higher education level. And so I really want to encourage that everyone here you know, think about how they can support all the work that IPPN is doing and ACAP is driving uh, so that we also have the right evidence, the right, you know, information and the right political will to drive those changes. This whole problem that your problem is not my problem, gender or women inequality should be a woman's problem, not a male's problem, also needs to shift because inclusivity matters to all. Inclusivity, we are able to create an inclusive workplace for women then I can assure you that workplace will be inclusive to everything. Because everything. the gender discrimination, discrimination of the all kinds of discrimination that actually exist, not just in Malaysia, but anywhere around the world. Um, and we need to be, we need to live alone. And Omicron, although now we are, you know, coming out of it to a certain extent, to a certain extent a bit more comfortable thanks to the vaccines, but a quick to show you, the only reason Omicron exists, reason exists and the threat of another variant of concern is still out there because look at that, Africa and certain parts of Latin America and certain parts of America are all still very under immunized. And as long as some people are not safe, everyone is not safe. And I think it's really important, you know, for us to reflect on how the world has actually managed COVID-19, there are so many successes, amazing that those vaccines were achieved so quickly. But when you think about how the inequity of vaccine distribution amongst countries, right? The fact that certain countries have more than five times more than they actually need, whereas some poor countries still haven't received or haven't. And it's easy for us to accuse those rich countries. But think about it, what happens as soon as you know there's going to be a lockdown? Tissue paper always runs out. Suddenly, all of us rush for our own self because we are trying to protect our own self. What we don't realize is that we start focusing on the trying to work for our own self to try to be better than all, then 
we fail as a society. Perhaps we need to be thinking about every time we want to grab more things than we need. Think about all the other opportunities where somebody else has grabbed it from you. Everyone here who looks like me, but what I meant was at least anatomical and genetically share the similar composition. I think it's about time that we also think about all those opportunities that we have grabbed from the women that we work with, live with, and you know, have the opportunity to interact with, and perhaps try and create a better world for them. With that, thank you very much. Thank you, Prof. Abi. It's a very interesting topic. And um, I think you are brave enough, okay, to take part in this event because uh, this is the fact, yeah, if you see the list of participants, it's only like 12% of them is a man and the rest is a woman. <laughs> All right. Um, so for the first question, okay, gender stereotyping affect the woman path to leadership, yeah, which limit the woman opportunity to hold position, promotion, okay, respected status in the workplace. Um, despite there's evidence that a woman is actually capable of being the top performers, um, but still, woman is not attaining a top level leadership position yeah, in comparison to the male peers which is uh, relates to the stereotyping of leadership traits. In your opinion, Prof, how can we change or avoid this mindset of men on this stereotyping because at the end it's become a sexist issues? What is your um, opinion, Prof? Oh yeah, so I, I think, you know, going back to what I shared, I, what you're trying to do, which is to create awareness, I mean, I guess, you know, I, I've been reading, it's true to a certain extent, upbringing helps. I mean, so I, I was lucky, you know, but despite both my parents not being university graduates um, and, and, you know, I'm totally middle class upbringing in Kuantan, my parents knew the importance of education and I'm very lucky that I had a very strong mother and I also had a very strong father, very strong, who knew that the value of having a strong mother. And I find that even though perhaps, you know, so my father, you know, many people say, oh, yeah, he is so relaxed. But I think it's that same relaxedness is the what allowed my mother to shine and to ensure that that her children were able to see, you know, the value of of a, of a strong woman, you know, in our household. Um, but not everyone, I, and I agree with it. Everyone has had the privilege of growing up with having a strong in my upbringing, and so that is why it shouldn't be about us versus them. It should really be about how can we create these opportunities? And this is through training, it's through self-reflection. It is for them to number one, realize that this problem actually affects them. So whether they agree or not, you know, at some point it's gonna affect them or the people that actually care for them. So that's number one. This is for the group of people who know it's a problem, but it's not their problem. But you also have the group in which where they don't even realize it's a problem. So this is where really IPPN and, and various different you know, groups need to do the kind of research and communicate this evidence out there. You see, it's because there's research out there that clearly states what's the statistics. No one can refute. If everyone just stopped and saying, ah, okay, la, we have 56% lecturers in university, what? yay, equality already achieved. But when you deep dive the data, then you realize. So we also need strong evidence to refute. Number three, is to then also try and get them to be part of the champion. And this is where I think I like the Asian culture where generally we are not really into calling people out and shaming people. I think that will never ever work because humans are very easy to find different ways to defend. And then you're just pushing people to become more and more polarized. But the whole idea is that we want, you know, not a gender equal but separated world. We want actually a gender equal and together world, right? So for me, the third part is, I think, going to be the biggest challenge. How can we convert the unconverted? How can we make them feel that it's okay to have a different perspective? There are going to be women who say that I don't need affirmative action. I can fight and achieve it on my own. There are going to be men who is going to say that, but I'm also being, you know, um, not, uh, uh, I'm uh, discriminated because I, I don't belong in any gender or I don't belong in this group or, you know, they are, crazy women leaders that are killing me. 
you know, you are just lucky, Abi, because you had, you know, amazing women leaders that were part of your pathway. But I don't have that opportunity. So you're going to find that it's important, and that's why I disclosed at the start. I'm not saying that women leaders are naturally better. I'm saying is that we need to have equal leadership opportunities for everyone. So that's the Thank you, approach. Thank you, Prof. B. It's uh, excellent answers. Okay. Um, I think it's all also answer the question by Surawati, right? Okay. And then we have another question from Bakriza. Women needs to be professional all the time, even the issue of gender discrimination obviously persists at the workplace, not to mention the overloaded works burn out, while the male workers often has privilege in a comfort zone. Maybe this is the different by culture or country? Yeah, so certainly uh, very different in culture and country. In fact, um, if you actually look at data that's actually out there, you will see that, um, you know, the Scandinavian countries do really well. Uh, but, you know, you would think countries like uh, France that has traditionally been very, you know, you always associated and I'm, I'm risking being, um, you know, really, really, I guess, what's the word, uh, uh, myopic and, and stereotyping here, but we always, you know, have equated, you know, uh, men with uh, in, in France as being very masculine and whatever it is. But you'll find in the recent statistics that the EU has actually announced that France has actually done the best amongst many other countries around in terms of in terms of representing a women in, in, in uh, corporate boards. And, and the reason for that is because they have very, very clear, very, very punitive impact if um, companies do not abide by the law. So, you know, um, to, your, to that third group, remember, which, you know, even though they recognize they will not want to change, ultimately you need to ensure that there is penalty. Just like how, you know, drivers, right? They're going to be those who will never want to wear safety belt, never want to follow um, uh, uh, driving rules. The only way that stops them is because there's a policeman there or there's a traffic. So we certainly cannot uh, and that's the rules. There certainly cannot be ambiguity uh, in our rules and uh, ways in which we are being translated. And I, I must say that in Malaysia, um, I'm going to say this rather contentiously, but even the issue of child marriages, you know, is still open to interpretation. I think uh, we need stronger political will, right, at every different level, including, for example, paternal, paternal leave, uh, things like um, childcare support, um, you know, kindergarten opportunities, you know, uh, working flexible arrangements. All of these cannot be just organizations doing it. There needs to be clear um, national, uh, uh, you know, and maybe that should be our G15, G16 demands. You know, all women and all men supporting women must say that I want to know what my local elective representative has to say about gender equality and equal opportunities. Okay, uh, if you have any more question for Prof. Abi, you may write it in the chat box and then I will read it uh, to him. Okay, I have another more question, yeah, Prof. Abi. No, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. Huh? Okay, so um, if you see the US news, huh? when it's come to the rank of perception of gender equality, uh, actually the worst countries are from Asian and also the Middle East continents. Um, do you think this is affected by the religious factor? Yeah, so I, I, I don't think it is just one factor, um, but I, I, I do think that, um, I'm not sure whether it's religion, but I certainly think it's culture. I think uh, the, the first part, which is called that old boys work, right? Why does old boys network work? Is because they are very clever in creating a silencing culture that don't stand up and make noise. And I think a lot of Asian cultures traditionally, I mean, and, and to a certain extent, I grew up in that too. Um, and I think there is some value in that, don't get me wrong, uh, is that there is a, a, a culture of deference to somebody older, somebody that is respected, and just don't, you don't need to stand out. Um, and, and I think we see that in classroom, right? Uh, and, and I've had the privilege of teaching in the UK and in the US uh, to short sabbaticals. And one of the things that I find difference in the students is the American students always will stand up and ask questions all the time, even if the questions are not necessarily much smarter than our Asian students. But when you ask the Asian students to write, when you ask them to do things, they actually perform even better. So, and why don't they come up and say, because they're shy, 
to actually challenge status quo. So I wouldn't say the word is religion. I would actually say the word is culture. But of course, there is a relationship between religion and culture. But also, again, how is that religion actually being spread? And I think we know how religion and the way we perceive to be religion is also influenced by our elders. And so that then goes again, you know, do we live in a patriarchal society, you know, and, and whatever. But I would like to say, you know, that just because there is this, you know, certain perception, because I also think the Western world is also a little unfair in certain ways. When they talk about gender gap, uh, pay gap, for example, you'll find that at least in, in most universities in Malaysia, if you are at a particular grade, right, um, and a position, your, your salary is exactly the same. With whether you're male or female, whether you're Indian, Chinese, or Malay, you know, if you are in that position, your pay is exactly the same. But if you go to the US and the UK, you may have the same position. You might even be higher ranked than a guy, but that person's pay may be actually higher than yours. So for me, basically, it's also important for us to question how are these global rankings and ratings measuring what they perceive as in, in inclusivity. And, and part of that problem is because Asians, we don't put enough emphasis on this. And to a certain extent, when you actually look at the KPIs of research today, uh, berapa patent, beri uh, seratus ribu, you have to count X number of patents, X number of papers. But we know that social science research, you know, which in this case today, it's so obviously so important. You're not going to translate to that same economic measures that, that we have. You also need a lot more patience the value but certainly you know great question uh one fatma we really really need to make sure that people certainly you know get enough information and evidence we need this kind of research and and i hope that you know i'm seeing uh prof yasrina and 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 acap as well as ITPN, uh, uh dr tian you know really i think you should use this opportunity to start thinking of long-term uh, a longitudinal research um, and, and really focus on asking these fundamental research questions. Um, because we talked about the tree of equity and equality. If you don't fix the root problem, we'll continuously, you will, you will probably invite me again in 10 years' time and ask me, Prof. Abi, can you talk about gender inequity and equity and equality and whatever it is? Yeah. Yes. You know, but, 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 but you know, there's cultural stuff, right? I, I grew up. You know, and I think sometimes I'm a bit more empathetic because I grew up with all the time people fat shaming me, you know, hey, fatty Abi, you know, like you're so lazy. I mean, you know, you grow up like that. Don't you care about how you look in the mirror? You know, so I've always grew up, you know, uh, with, with, so in, in, I must say in Asia, it is okay to shame us like this kind of ways, you know, uh, and, and, and maybe it's not maybe, it's certainly not acceptable. Okay, thank you, Prof Abi. Um, I think it's already 11.23. Okay, so I think we need to stop here. There's no other question in the chat box. So I cannot deny you're a very great um, communicator, Prof. Abi, and we thank you for your participant today. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm so sorry that I, I was not able to answer all the questions out there, but can I just say thank you so much to uh, Dr. Tian and organizers and ACAP for this amazing opportunity and all participants today. Thank you. And you're going to hear the best chair of YSN ESM to date after this anyway. So stay tuned. Okay, so we stop uh, for a break for five minutes and then uh, we will resume again at 11.30 with Dr. Chai. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye, everyone.